Still another way that the College Board has made your life easier and our choices harder is that the required works list now only includes two early Italian Renaissance paintings, Fra Filippo Lippi's Madonna and Child with Two Angels and Botticelli's Birth of Venus. These are wonderful paintings and I look forward to looking at them in more depth. But I refuse to give an entirely to the College Board's agenda, especially since the two chosen works do not display some of the most innovative, characteristic, and I think important features of early Renaissance painting. Sister Wendy kicks off the Masaccio, and so will I. This painting used to be a College Board favorite. Masaccio uses continuous narrative to tell three parts of the Bible passage where Peter asks Jesus if he will pay taxes to Rome. In reply, Jesus sends him off to find a coin in the mouth of a fish, and that's what Peter uses to pay the tax. The context is much debated, but some art historians think that the patron wanted to express support for the taxes that Florence officials were trying to collect to raise more money to defend Florence. Remember that a political subtext is an important element of early Italian art. We saw this with Donatello's David and Judith. But let's hone in on form or style. And by the way, I'm going to apologize. These build in a strange way, and so I may sometimes get messed up. So what elements of this painting's form show Giotto's influence, and which show Masaccio's movement beyond the Proto-Renaissance? Like Giotto, Masaccio uses a figure with his back to us to draw the viewer into the painting. Really, the man in the orange doublet with bare legs is a stand-in for us, the viewer. The fully modeled figures like Giotto's have volume and weight, defined by chiaroscuro, but now we're seeing musculature as well. The bare legs help. Both the Giotto painting and the Masaccio use atmospheric perspective. Objects further away are blurrier, softer in value, and bluer. But note that Masaccio's gradations are subtler and more realistic. He is taking nature as an actual model. Still, that isn't really the big difference, is it? Okay, here we go. The Tribute Money is one of the earliest paintings to employ mathematical perspective. Masaccio was a close friend of Brunelleschi's, and he knew his studies of perspective very well. Note how the orthogonals converge on Christ's head at the horizon line. And as his close-up of one of the faces reveals, Masaccio also made far more use of contrasts of light and dark to define volume and fit space. Here's an illustration of chiaroscuro, similar to what you saw in your textbook. So you'll surely remember, remember the extraordinarily evocative Adam and Eve from Sister Wendy's video. It's from the same Brancacci Chapel, a set of paintings. Uh, but the Masaccio, but Masaccio did not originally get the commission for the Brancacci Chapel. It went to Mussolino, a well-known proto-Renaissance painter whose works also appear in the frescoes. So what differences do you see? Well, I'd note not only the far greater emotional depth of Masaccio's painting, which is what Sister Wendy focused on, but also the greater use of chiaroscuro, the sense of movement, and the portrayal of Adam and Eve as much more three-dimensional figures moving in a three-dimensional space. So here's another fav famous Masaccio painting, and it's one of Ms. Jacobs' favorites. We see God the Father holding up God the Son with God the Spirit as a somewhat hard to see dove on Christ's head. The viewer's eye is drawn up to the figures of the Trinity. We're looking at this from below, but also down to the skeletal memento mori below the figures, a very common symbol that served as a reminder of death. The deep recess, which is entirely a pictorial illusion, draws the viewer into the scene and therefore into communion with God. So the perspectival composition of this painting is extraordinarily accurate and extraordinarily complex. Note that the composition is based on a series of triangles, which itself echoes the Trinity. Also note that the patrons are larger than the figures of Mary and John at the base of the cross. Since they're closer to us in space, they should be larger. But this is a rejection of hierarchical scale. Optical perspective has replaced conceptual perspective. Again, you've already dis heard Sister Wendy discuss this painting, and alas, it no longer appears on a required works list. 
I just note that Fra Angelico's perspective is not as mathematically accurate, but still, he uses architectural features to create a sense of depth and space, if a flatter space than we saw in Masaccio. His division of interior and exterior spaces was typical of Giotto's frescoes as well. There's a lot of Giotto influence here. The open courtyard in which the angel confronts Mary is called a logia. That term sometimes shows up in the AP exam. And indeed, you want to be able to identify this interior as typically Renaissance. Note the beautifully rendered Corinthian columns. Ah, finally, a required work. Uh, if you had time to watch the Medici vid video, you know that the monk who painted this work was not as angelic as Fra Angelico, and for that matter, his angels aren't as angelic either. Some art historians think that the angel on the bottom right, who's looking out at us with what I would say is a very impish smile, is actually Lippi's son with the nun he ran off with, a boy who grew up to be another famous Renaissance painter, Filipino Lippi. In fact, the model for the Madonna may have been Filipino's mother, the former nun Lucretia, although neither of these identifications has been confirmed. So, what's happened to the halo? It's almost disappeared, and soon it will disappear altogether in the Renaissance pursuit of more naturalism. So how would you compare this to Giotto's Madonna and Child on the right? Well, both of the figures have weight and substance. If anything, I'd say that Giotto's Mary has a more obvious physical form. She's bulkier. But this Mary and baby, that is Lippi's, are even more human and really even more sensual. Lippi's Mary also has a much more secular beauty and setting. So notice that huge pearl over Mary's finely coiffured hair and that string of pearls receding in a striking triangle from her high forehead. She sits on an ornate piece of furniture in a gray stone window through which we see cultivated fields, soaring rocks, and a distant city. This is crucial to the painting's intimacy. It brings the Madonna forward. Her shadow is on the frame in a painting lit from the right, another physical as opposed to spiritual detail. She's placed in front of the window like an actor in front of a stage. The realistic landscape, by the way, is another Renaissance feature. Lippi was heavily influenced by Flemish landscapes. We'll see a few in a moment. Uh, apparently, this is an identifiable Florentine space with the River Arno in the background. Let's look quickly at a few other paintings by Lippi, both to help you in case you get hit by an attribution question, but more to tease out the formal qualities of his painting. You think maybe the painting on the right was influenced by Masaccio's Trinity? We see some foreshortening here, but in general, Lippi is less interested in perspective and even chiaroscuro and more interested in the play of line. And one reason for this, which is also true of Botticelli, stay tuned, uh, is that Lippi painted in egg tempera. Because tempera dried very quickly, it was hard to create subtle blends of color, although both Giotto and Masaccio pulled it off. But still, the medium of tempera leads, lends itself to crisper, clearer lines. So these angels don't look much uh, as look as much like they're up to mischief, but we still see the beautiful serene faces and the strong use of line, especially in the flowers. Almost all of Lippi's paintings were religious and most were of Mary, but the painting on the right is actually the earliest surviving double portrait in Italian art, very interestingly composed. Note again the strong use of line and the emphasis on the woman's luxurious clothing, uh, Profiles, by the way, were a deliberate Renaissance evocation of Renaissance coinage. So none of our Italian Renaissance required works is a portrait. Uh, but in fact, the Renaissance emphasis on individual achievement the admiration of Roman portrait statues and Roman coins, and the growing patronage of a wealthy merchant class all created a demand for personal portraits, not just portraits as disguised as religious paintings. You just saw a Lippi example, and here are two paintings by the Florentine painter Girlandaio. Note again how much individual personality, even the rather austere profile portrait conveys. Oh, Ms. Jacobs and I love this painting and wish we could linger, but just notice how the painter uses foreshortening, line, and perspective to bring order to this chaotic scene. So I'm going to end my early Renaissance painting lecture with Botticelli. This one is the College Board required work and probably a painting you would have recognized even before you took this course. 
Botticelli, too, was less obsessed with perspective than his Florentine contemporaries. In some way, his work seems closer to the late Gothic style, which is known as international Gothic. Well, international Gothics have disappeared from our list, but I'm going to show you one of my favorites quickly. The customers for these works were mostly princely courts. So notice the brilliant colors. That's expensive to produce. The heavy use of gold leaf, also expensive. And the extraordinarily detailed depiction of clothing and horses. These people cared about their duds. So here's Botticelli's take on the same scene. Botticelli was another of our artists who thrived under the patronage of the Medici, in this case, Cosimo's grandson, Lorenzo the Magnificent. And several of the figures in this painting are identifiable historical personages. So the older man kneeling in front of the Virgin is Cosimo de' Medici. The arrogant young man on the left is his grandson, Lorenzo the Magnificent, Botticelli's main patron. By the way, the figure on the right, looking out at the viewer, is probably Botticelli himself. So back to our Venus. The statue on the left is the Venus de' Medici, or Modest Venus. It's a first century BCE Hellenistic copy, probably of a work by Praxiteles, and it was one of the Med Medici family's prized possessions. So do you notice a resemblance? Botticelli was clearly sucking up to his patron and to their interest in the classical world. Lorenzo the Magnificent, by the way, had earlier commissioned a verse form of the Greek author Hesiod's account of Venus's birth. So this was a very important story to this very important patron. And it's quite a narrative. According to Hesiod, Cronus cut off Uranus's genitals and cast them into the sea, and the foam symbolized his semen. Uh, out of that foam uh, was born Aphrodite, or Venus, fully grown. She rested on the shell until she drifted to shore, blown by the zephyrs, or winds, that you see on the left. When she arrived, she was greeted by one of the three graces, a semi-divinity, and one of the graces uh, covered her up properly. So what makes the content so innovative and a little shocking? Mythological subjects were popular in Italian Renaissance literature, but they were just starting to make a comeback in art, and really Botticelli spearheaded this movement. And frankly, he also used a mythological scene as an excuse to explore the female nude. This was the first monumental female nude of a pagan goddess since Roman times but not the first female nude. Eve got to show up in paintings without her clothes too, which may account for some of the popularity of this theme in religious art. Gotta pack them into those churches. The use of canvas was innovative as well. Previously, this material had been used mostly for parade banners. Actually, this painting's original function may have been as a banner, maybe even a banner for one of Florence's uh, many festive parades in honor of a wedding. To add a historical note, I can't resist. The painting disappeared into obscurity almost immediately. When Napoleon ransacked the Italian collections in the early 19th century, he didn't even bother stealing Botticelli's, including this painting. In 1815, after the Napoleonic Wars ended, the painting was moved from the Medici Palace to the Uffizi, a very famous art museum, but it wasn't considered one of the museum's major works. It only regained notice and popularity at the end of the 19th century, when taste came back around to Botticelli's style. So what would you note about the painting's form or style? I'm struck by how much motion there is in the painting. The outflung cloak, the blowing hair, the zephyrs alighting on the shore. Like Lippi, Botticelli relied heavily on lines. So you note the exquisite detail of the plants and the rhythmic patterns of the clothing and shells. It's a very good example of rhythm and painting. His colors are bright, but they're soft. In other words, to use art, historic, art history terms, the values in the painting are not especially high, but the colors are saturated. And while the receding sea and small boat create a horizon and a sense of space, we don't see the kind of technical show-off perspective of, say, Masaccio's works. So let's look at a few other famous Botticelli's. You'll notice that Botticelli's beautiful women bear a certain resemblance to each other. One possible model was a famous society beauty, Simonetta Vespucci, shown here uh, in a portrait that was not by Botticelli. But many art historians dispute this, and there's no real direct evidence except a document indicating Botticelli's admiration for her looks. 
So this painting, along with the birth of Venus and Primavera, which we'll see in a moment, are sometimes referred to as furniture paintings. Note their shape. Uh, they were private paintings, and they were usually intended for the bedroom. That long, narrow shape fit easily over a bed. And in that spirit, here is one of Botticelli's most famous bedroom paintings. It's filled with symbolism. I used to teach this. Alas, we really don't have time. But note that these last paintings have all addressed mythological themes. But of course, Botticelli painted religious themes as well. Most of the market was for religious art. Remember Judith? Not one of Botticelli's finest works in my mind. But I love his Madonna and Child. I'd still hate to be asked whether the painter was Botticelli or Lippi. I think there's a lot of resemblance. The Botticelli story does not end happily. At the end of the 15th century, a Dominican friar, Savonarola, attracted huge crowds with sermons warning the Florentines that they were heading straight to hell if they did not abandon their materialistic ways and especially their very wicked art. And he had terrific timing. In 1494, the king of France invaded Italy, and that seemed to fulfill Savonarola's prophecies. So at the monks' urgings, the Florentines expelled the ruling Medici, they established a popular republic, and they set out to destroy wicked works of literature and art in huge bonfires. That's where we get the term bonfires of the vanities, because that's what they were called. Botticelli became a follower of Savonarola. He may or may not have burned some of his paintings in the bonfire. The record isn't clear, but he did paint this scene from Greek history of an innocent youth being attacked by slander. And this may, again, art historians disagree, have been Botticelli's defense of Savonarola, who was, in fact, eventually executed for slandering the Pope, among other things. The second part of the Medici video has a terrific account of this episode, which we don't have time to show in class. I've put the video and these times up on Moodle in case you'd like to know more. And now we head north and back in time again to the splendid works of the Northern Renaissance.